easy on the microphone. Okay, thank you. Salute. Okay, um, yes, unfortunately I have to do it in English because I can't speak Romanian and uh, the only thing I can say uh, means uh, cheers in German, but it's a uh, sphere word I learned. Uh, in German we say instead of cheers, word, we say duro, right? We say post, post, word. that's not good, I can say here in this video to somebody instead of cheers, but it's the only thing I learned so far. And um, anyway, um, I want to talk about natural user interfaces and um, how we can build better user experience in the near future with all the challenges uh, we currently have. Um, a lot of people are talking about things like uh, Internet of Things, um, the industrial Internet of Things, machine-to-machine um, -machine communication. So we are in a changing market. Uh, currently we talk about mobile scenarios, mobile devices, but this is about to change. We will discuss about um, a lot of gadgets, small devices, which are somehow connected. And this means we have to deal with complete different paradigms for user interfaces, for interactivity, um, to make uh, this experience, the experience of technology, somehow a little bit better. And therefore, I have uh, this uh, small image of my son. Uh, is the only image of two you have to see in this presentation. Um, because uh, user experience somehow is very much related to my business, the way I do it, because um, I try everything with them. Um, unfortunately, they are now a little bit older than on this image, uh, so I, I misuse them too much. They are now very experienced, so I need to make some new kids which are some more innate to interactivity. But uh, that's the way I use it, and this is very helpful, because if I experience something together with my kids, then it's easy to explain this to my colleagues because it's hard to convince them to change something new um, because I, I work with a large corporation and there are a lot of people which fear change because change somehow feels very dangerous to them. But if I tell them that my, even my kids do understand that, then they change their mindset a little bit. So that helps me very much. And to get into this situation, I love to do something I call value prototyping. That's some, something like building a firehouse, uh, something like a, uh, like a submarine strategy. Build something very fast, um, like a proof of concept as, as a basis for discussion, to visualize your idea, to somehow make it possible to, to experience something, to make it vivid. That's the way I work. That's the way I do something to demonstrate new ways of interactivity. And um, this leads me to this change I, I uh, recently mentioned, because in the past there has been a many-to-one relationship. That means many people sitting in front of a TV set. But this is about to change. This is the past. Uh, but this change is somehow slow. Not everybody is able to adapt this new possibilities. Uh, and therefore, there's something in between in the meantime, like, for example, the second screen experience uh, to add a device to this many-to-one relationship. And I have one sample with me. Oh, this is uh, for this is uh, for Walking Dead, a series, and uh, it's based on all your fingerprinting. That means based on the audio signal in the TV series, the application on the tablet does know what you are currently looking, and then you can make a bet on the the, uh, the, the um, people in this movie, how many uh, zombies they kill, which weapon they are using. So that's a very strange kind of experience to to make it more interactive, this many-to-one relationship. Anyway, this is just one sample for second screen experience. There are much more. But um, as I mentioned, um, it's, that's a big change because um, not only this many-to-one relationship using a TV set is about to change, also the devices we are using are much more uh, that means uh, there are much more devices we can use. Uh, for example, a TV set is not that dumb in quotes anymore like in the past. The one you see on the left side is, uh, for example, a smart TV set with Android inside. So that's basically the same thing like a mobile device, like a mobile phone. The only difference is you can't carry it with you easily and it's a little bit awkward to use it as a phone because of the size. Anyway, 
uh, tablets, mobile phones you know already. And there's a development kit, uh, it's based on Android as well. That, that's something for making machine to machine scenarios, Internet of Things scenarios, but it uses the same technology like a mobile device. So mobile is turning somehow, it's, it's evolving into a lot of more devices we can use. And my favorite one is on the right side. Anybody knows what it is? I think.
that's a little bit scary, but it's already here, something like that. Uh, this sample is from, I think, 2005, uh, and it's on public places. It's based on image recognition, where a camera can detect the change on this place, on the spot, and based on that, they change uh, the projection. So you see, they can shrink people and uh, move them away. So the whole place interacts with the system, and just based on easy image recognition. It's very, very easy. Another sample I have for you is um, the tracking based on beacons on BLE devices. Um, this one is a showcase by a German digital agency where everybody who is using the stairs in the agency gets tracked by, by beacons by Bluetooth proximity detection in the, in the stair, um, stair, upstairs uh, when he's going in, in his office and they have kind of a high score to motivate the people. They use gamification for this kind of proximity marketing, this proximity sports detection. Another one based on proximity uh, is already available as well at Macy's, for example, and some other retailers. If you get close to a shelf with some offerings, you get coupons, you get information, you can buy it, you get special discounts. Um, that's something which is also already available, but we are now about to somehow roll out it to different stores and to different ideas because not only the stairs could be detected, um, the movement through the stairs, not the shelves only. You also use it, for example, in sports stadiums um, for getting a, a good bargain for buying a sausage, something like that. And there are several technologies you can use. But you see, everything could be somehow connected. Shelves, uh, sausages, uh, coffee capsules, uh, cars, and, and places. Everything somehow gets interactive. And we expect three devices per square meter in the near future, for example, inside your home. That's something we expect, and that's a challenge to connect all these things in a more or less natural way, because everything that can be connected will be connected. In the past, we tried to turn everything into something digital, and nowadays we try to connect everything somehow and make something good out of it, to find new scenarios. This, by the way, is a very challenging approach. Even if we, as Deutsche Telekom, this is uh, Tim Hurtgers, our CEO, even if we think um, everything that can be connected will be connected, it's very challenging to find new ideas, new businesses. We have uh, lots of opportunities, but there's, uh, for most people, there's no current need. There's no issue, no problem we can solve right now. So we have to, to somehow create new needs. It's a little bit like, like the first iPhone or the first tablet, let's say the first um, iPad. Nobody ever did miss a tablet PC. Nobody in the whole world. But anyway, Apple released a tablet, and once the people got used to using a tablet, they won't miss it anymore. They will keep it. They want one. And this is a challenge in doing business nowadays. We have to create needs. We have to find things. Nobody is aware that this might be an issue. And um, this is very, very challenging because we anyway expect around about 50 billion somehow connected devices in our environment in the near future. We have to build something new on top of it. There will be some really strange things like this, um, this smart brick in the top left corner. Uh, Sony has a patent on that. That's no joke. There's really a smart brick. The artificial hair you can wear which somehow acts like a navigation system. There's uh, my favorite one, this toilet paper printer who prints, uh, um, uh, which prints Twitter feeds, <coughs> uh, connected car, for example, is possible. Even cows, as we have seen in the former slide, can send text messages to, to um, inform the farmer about uh, fertility. Uh, we have, um, for example, this uh, smart toothbrush, a toothbrush which is connected to control the way you clean your teeth. And uh, there's some smart uh, toaster which can toast the current weather or some stocks on your toast, whatever you like. So every day things getting digital. And people have to learn how to deal with it, how to deal with their privacy. Even the legal system in, in all countries 
is not sufficient for this challenge. We have to, to learn how to deal with privacy, security, um, how to change the legal things. This is something which is about to change. For example, who is responsible if an autonomously driven car makes an accident? It's who pays for it, for example. On the other side, even business is changing. Insurances, for example, they really fear autonomously driving cars, connected cars, because then there will be no accident anymore. If that really works as expected, there will be no business for car insurances anymore. So they need to find new business, new approaches for earning money. Um, and how dangerous this could be, can you see, if you, if you look at this uh, media cup, for example, that's a cup which, um, which can detect the usage based on its tilt, on, its, on an accelerometer, based on the temperature of what it's inside. And they have a heuristic, they develop a heuristic which detects if you're in your office and if, if you are working or not. So that's somehow dangerous. If your employer gives you a cup which is connected, you should think about it. And um, this capacitive fork, it, it's supposed to help you doing a diet. But it's also a little bit dangerous because they even could uh, detect what and when and how you are eating and could give you some recommendations. They could sell you something on top of it, or maybe your healthcare insurance might be interested in your, in your eating behavior to change your rate, something like that. So it's a very shallow market, and we have to learn how to, yes, how to really to say it in, in a strange and a double meaning way, how to expose ourselves. What do we want to publish? What do we want to show to the public? What, what do we need to show? Um, to our friends and what should we like to keep private. How to deal with this, it's called quantified self. That's really a challenge because not only our active behavior can be detected, even what we are in quote are thinking is, is possible to detect. It's already possible to, to manipulate something due to your brain power, but even if that's only a toy which is very fuzzy, you even could use a wet towel with the same result. Um, there are some medical devices, like this one, which really work. It's possible to drive a car, to drive a wheelchair, just with brain power. And the, milita the military is very interested in that, because using brain power is much faster than really acting with your muscles because there's no, no way between your nerves and your brain needed. So they are really developing a lot in this area. But you also can detect the gender, the age of somebody, the mood, and even the health without knowing. Yes, even, for example, I have a Kinect here with me, and uh, the newer one is that uh, the accuracy is that good that it can detect your blood pressure based on the temperature of your skin. That's something they really can detect. They can detect your mood based on your face and on your, on, your, uh, on your voice. These are things which are already possible and there's a beverage dispenser in Japan um, which uh, gives you recommendations. So if you stand in front of this beverage vending machine, it says uh, what you should drink based on your age, on your gender, on your health. Everything they take into account. And this is something we even have to deal with. We usually should collect data for good intents, but how can we be sure that this really happens? In terms of Dirty Telecom, luckily, uh, we have a very strong regulation, we have very strong uh, rules in Germany, so we don't have to be scared about what we are doing. But um, what anybody else is doing, I, I don't know. Especially in the Anglo Saxonian region, they have not that strict uh, legal rules, so it's uh, much more possible. Anyway, to find new ideas and to, to build something on top of that, uh, we do something we call product incubation, or as I mentioned before, before value prototyping. I personally like to call it a fail fast approach because the approach gives you the opportunity to fail fast, and failing fast is much better than working on something for a long time, uh, defining a lot of requirements, and doing a lot of research, and then after one year and spending 100,000 euros or more, uh, you, you realize it's not possible to do it in that way. We, we try to change it a little bit. We 
just um, use a very naive, childish um, approach, just building a first prototype on, on your gut feeling somehow, a very prototyping way in only a few days. And if this succeeds, we know it's worth to spend more effort in doing something. But if, if it fails in the first approach, we think about the reasons why did it fail, do we have to spend some more effort, some more money, some more investigation, or doesn't it make sense? But it's very helpful to do it in that way. It's a little bit like acting like a startup. Startups are not that much different. And um, therefore, if you have ideas like that, you should definitely get in touch with Deutsche Telekom. Um, because there are so many units which can help you in quotes. For example, Who Brown is supporting an active based startup. They are doing a lot of things. T-Venture makes something similar, but uh, with a huge, with a bigger scale, with more, more money involved. And if our department I work in for is a very strong in partnering. So if we have something finished, uh, a good idea, we can talk about partnering, white labeling, adding our services to your product, getting your product in our portfolio. That's something we do, and together with Moonprom, you get um, facilities, for example, if you don't have some, uh, you get uh, access to what we are offering, our APIs, you get funding, you get marketing support, <coughs> and for all of you who are involved in some startups, uh, we currently have two challenges. One is called the Telecom Innovation Contest. It's basically for students and startups. And well, it's a little bit uh, uh, fast soon, the 11th of April, but if you can't make it, the other one, the Hoopbrom Walk Contest for the Eastern European region um, might be of interest for you as well. And if you have some questions, Alina Diana, you're from um, Rome Telecom and Konfronti, um, and, uh, uh, these both can help you with that, right? So if they have questions, they can come to you or to me. So if you want to speak a Romanian language, they might be much more helpful than me. In English, I try to help you. I can get you in touch with the Hoopbrom people. Anyway, very helpful would be to have a prototype, to discuss your ideas, discuss something like that, the way I do it in our internal way, doing prototypish things, is basically the same. And prototypes are good for two reasons. First of all, to experience what you are doing, to make a proof of concept, and to have a base of discussions. And the prototypish approach is very much like Lego play. It's very much like kids do something. Um, if you observe kids doing something, innovating in quotes, um, they, they have an idea, for example, building a Star Wars spaceship. That's something which drives, uh, for example, my son. And uh, in the age of, I would assume, three, he, he took a single Lego brick, and then he flew through the living room making strange noises. And that was his first version, his first iteration. And then he realized while testing, Oh, there are some fundamental things missing. I need some mini figures on it. Yes, for example, I need laser guns, I need lamps. So he continued iterating, testing, iterating in a very agile manner. And in the end, he had some solution. <coughs> um, maybe he, he failed, but he had learned a lot, or he succeeded, and he was very convinced on what, what he is doing. And this is a very agile iteration and innate process. You don't have to learn how agile and iterative prototyping works. It's already inside you, but you lost this behavior. You only have to reactivate it, and then it's very, very easy. Even if I go to customers, I have something which be like um, this Lego robot. Uh, this is based on the idea of connected car. Unfortunately, I can't take a car with me going to my customers, and I can't destroy cars to show them how accidents work and how e-call emergency calls work. Therefore, I have this Lego robot, and I can develop something together with them. Uh, sometimes uh, I prepare some code snippets. I, I work together with my customers in code, even if they are not developers. The only approach is to be fast, to proceed very fast to a solution. And therefore, we have, we have a bunch of interactive devices we can use nowadays. We have development boards, Raspberry Pi, Arduino. It's easy to connect with Bluetooth, NFT, whatever you like. So you need your PC. You are embedded board, you need some interactive devices, you need gadgets. Um, I, for example, have borrowed, uh, oh, you can see it a little bit, this electric construction kit by my son. And there's an Arduino board on top. And um, together with the M2M department of Deutsche Telekom, 
I have added a GSM shield, so I can hopefully use it here effectively. I try to send an SMS to this board. And yes, uh, it's roaming, so it might take a while until this SMS arrives at the board. It's just an SMS that it takes on. And you see the motor is driving. And uh, I could even call the system by a voice. There's a voice control version, but this is an example of this uh, environment. I broke, you see? <laughs> and uh, this is something I do. And to do it in this way, we have a bunch of APIs, uh, like uh, APIs for, for identity management, for payment, for operator billing, for detecting your location, speed recognition, sending SMS, um, doing voice calls, all the things we have. And if you are bored about my talk, uh, I can change it to a, a small red lamp. You still can um, send uh, text messages like on or off to this number and turn it on and off during my talk if you like. I did it at home with my kids with this bubble gun. And I invite you strongly, I invite you to go to markets uh, Look out for these Chinese crap toys, the cheap ones, and you can disassemble them and easily connect them to your PC, to your laptop, to a board like this, uh, this uh, Arduino board here. It's, it's very, very easy. And this is something we do with customers. For example, that's a vending machine which is capable of sending and receiving text messages uh, to get control. It's not for maintenance purpose. That's something we already have in this way. It's, uh, it's meant to be for really ordering something or getting an uh, invoice via SMS, via text message back from the system. This is something uh, I did together with Oracle. It's an interactive espresso machine which you can control via voice. You really can call it. You can say on, off, small, whatever you want to have as a copy. Uh, but it does make sense uh, to make a copy if you are far away from home. But it's a kind of a proof of concept. It's a technology study. Because this espresso machine doesn't have to be an espresso machine, it could be an industrial solution, something from the automotive or automation industry, whatever you like. And we have to, to, yes, to make it even more workful, to, to useful, to add a value. We have, as I mentioned, a lot of APIs. And in my role, I have, um, I think I have the best job you can have at Deutsche Telekom because I have the opportunity to test all these things, uh, to evaluate these APIs, uh, to some people call it proposition management, to say what we need, what we have to change, makes it sense to, to include it in our portfolio. Therefore, I did a lot of research, for example, for location-based services, for, for um, very near proximity-based location services, for far away location-based services, micro-location, and so on. I, I used NFC, Bluetooth, and one very interesting thing is, uh, for example, roaming. Roaming is very useful for credit card companies. That's really a business. They only need to know in which country you are, because if you are in, for example, Germany, but then somebody with your credit card is paying in Romania, there seems to be something going wrong with the cab driver. And uh, if you, for example, sell IT, based on these towers where you get connectivity with your GSM network. Even that is very useful. We used it with parcel services because it consumes less power than GPS. It's much more efficient. And for a parcel service, it's fine to know in which area you are based on your cell tower. So it's really sufficient. And the GSM device, it lasts for a week or longer. So it's, it's perfect for parcel services or for for um, securing your, your artwork, or if you have a very expensive tree, you could secure it somehow based on this service. And this gives you context. This is something we nowadays have. In the past, we talked about command line, uh, command line interfaces, graphical user interfaces, about uh, things like natural user interfaces using gestures, touch, and so on. And nowadays, we talk about super natural user interfaces. That means beyond natural user interfaces. And their context gets more and more important. This is one sample, but it's not that much based on context. But it's, um, 
It's it, it happened accidentally. It's for a, for a music band, and they uh, wanted to have uh, something interacting with the music. This LED presentation in the background um, is detecting the noise and therefore changes something. But during their concert, they realized that the audience did start interacting with the LED presentation because if they start singing, they, they do a certain amount of noise as well, and therefore the LED presentation changed in the background. So they stopped doing music, just holding the mic to the audience, and then the LED presentation changes. That's a complete new way of interactivity, of interaction. And it's very much relating to speech processing, speech recognition, speech synthesis. There are so many ways where you can interact. And maybe if, if you don't know it, um, Dark Star is an awesome movie. You have to see it because there's a, a philosophical bomb uh, where they have to convince the bomb not to explode in a very philosophical way because the bomb says, uh, uh, I think, therefore I am, for example, the bomb says. So it shows you how difficult speech recognition communicating with the PC might be. Anyway, synthesis was possible uh, without PCs as well. I like this one because it's, uh, it's really a strange version without a PC uh, generating artificial voice. So that's how it works. And
It was just a, just a phenomenon. But if he had followed the, the real process, I don't think we, we would <laughs> sit here right now and discuss things like that. So he's my, my personal hero thinking about the common sense knowledge of computers. They don't have any. And this is a good example as well for speech Changing recognition. Two hours. No. Maybe it can be the only time. Changing to a ball now. Marker, in my case, don't even get me started about your friends. <laughs> Changing to friends. Wait, are you listening to me or what's on TV? Okay. Siri, so turn on Genius. Genius activated. You recently watched Real Sex 32. You may also enjoy Cat House. No. Siri so TV. Still working out. <sighs> Seriously? So you see it's uh, not that easy um, to build something like that. Uh, I have one more sample <laughs> I, I would like to, like to try with you. Maybe it works. Um, it's been based on the Kinect to show you what I mean using, using interactivity, including context. And Take anything you have 
everything you have in account. Uh, this is his sample, but it's basically it's really the same. It's the generic quick link from, from design to the US. But technically, it's very, very easy. But to do something like that, you should think about cheap devices. The Kinect doesn't cost you a fortune. It's not that expensive. You can use Xbox devices. You can use, um, like I mentioned, Lego. There are so many things you can buy for, for a little close amount of money to build new ways of interactivity, to proceed very fast, to get a very fast result. And once you have a good idea, then you can spend much more effort in privacy, security, making it more stable, building your own hardware. Then the next level starts. But first you have to be creative because concerns and uh, requirements, they, they limit your creativity. But um, innovating means you have to, to think about new ideas in a very naive and childish approach, I personally think. And therefore, I, I use um, a lot of development devices. May I have to use one more, one more sample? Because, because he didn't show me that I'm running out of time, but I want to show you one more great example. It's um, based on the Makey Makey, and it's an Arduino board which acts like a keyboard, so that means uh, you don't have to have any special skills. You can use Word and Excel with that. You can, you can navigate through your PowerPoint presentation because everything I do with this device, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's converted into a keystroke. So therefore, I can use a banana, for example. Even a banana works, and I can, again, Ina and Diana, could you please help me again? So, because I think that how to use it. <laughs> so uh, just the metal part, please, the metal part. And you two, okay. Oh, you see my presentation is running already. And now I can, um, I can interact with these two girls.
could be very playful, it could be fun. And uh, I do two things. Uh, one thing is to, to walk around with open eyes. Uh, for example, it happened once at the fair for kids uh, that there was, uh, there was uh, uh, a gift, uh, a candy machine, gift machine where you can grab, grab a candy grab at the end. A candy grab where you can grab a, a small toy, something like that. And the kids could wear a, a wrist thing uh, just uh, with contracting the muscles to, to move around this candy grabber. It is something uh, which is very important for people who don't have an arm or a leg anymore. It's the same way to, to interact with the frozen cases. And therefore I thought I have to experience it. I have to because I want to know how it feels. Unfortunately it was fair for kids. So I had to get in the line of all these kids only wanting sweets. Uh, I was the only one in this line who just wanted to explore the mansion. And uh, the student, uh, the supervisor student at the mansion, he said, no, not for adults. And I always came back to the line and I said, I just want to try it. I don't want these sweets. And I agreed really to negotiate with this guy. I was the only one that tall between all the small people, but I tried it. You could have just bribed me with a sweet that you weren't going to get. Yeah, yeah, I, I gave them away to somebody else. But uh, this is something I do. Uh, every time my kids tell me something about a toy, something about a game, I, not every time, but 80% of the time I really buy it. So I think my kids are the happiest kids in, in the world because they get all these toys, all the things you can discover, and I discover them myself. I play with them myself. That's the one approach. Just walk around and experience your environment. <coughs> Stay as a kid somehow. And the other approach is a little bit more professional. Um, that's uh, the search field approach. That means, on the one side, you have to narrow your search field. That means, uh, what constraints do you have? Uh, this is something I try to limit, because constraints do, they're not very helpful in getting creative, but a little bit of them are helpful to not lose the focus. And you can widen your search field. And there are a lot of things like, for example, mood boards. Now, mood board is, it's, I think it's one of the best approaches. If you have, if you have a, a scenario, and something, a customer, something you have to work with, you should try to get everything which is somehow related to this customer and the project. That could be a, a movie, that could be a snippet from a newspaper, that could be a painting, that could be something haptical, some some electric device or something like that. And then you place all these things together like a collage. And then it's a mood board because it helps you to widen your search field. These are a few of all the strategies you can use. But these are the most common ones and very easy to use. And they help you to, to brainstorm, to associate, to think about them. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again, Sasha. Okay. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you.